Welcome to the Home Business Podcast with Richard Captain Henderson, publisher of Home Business Magazine, and Sherilyn Colleen, managing editor. This how-to show helps you successfully operate your home-based business. Greetings and welcome to the Home Business Podcast. I'm Richard Captain Henderson, your skipper at Home Business TV. And I'm Lynn, your co-host. <laughs> Let's care for C and get underway. A typical knee-jerk reaction to raising capital to start up a grow a business is to seek out investors. In today's tough competitive business world, we might not have a Silicon Valley cushion of investors we can tap for funding. The key? Find your market product fit and instead of looking to outside investors, look to your own customers who you have already built trust with. The power of social media platforms makes customer financing possible for any business owner, including home-based. And expert linking customer financing with social media is Colton Bollinger. Colton shares advice on how businesses can grow or expand their business without giving up equity. So greetings, Colton Bollinger. Welcome to the Home Business Podcast. Say hello. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Really excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. So you're you're dialing in from beautiful San Diego by what? By Pacific Beach? <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, rough life out here. California oh. dreaming and dreaming of financing. Uh, beautiful place <laughs> you beautiful place you live in. A lot of memories out there. Yeah, no, you were saying you 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 spent some time out here at one point, huh? Yeah, I used to live in uh, Huntington Beach, and then uh, went went in and out of there forever with the Navy. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's probably it's considered the best place in the military to be stationed. <laughs> I, know, I, I can probably, see why. <laughs> see a why. lot of people fighting to get billets out there. Well, let's dive right into business financing, Colton. How did you start a business without going into debt? All right. So it really started with kind of you know an accidental business, like a lot of successful startups. I think you know that that passion for doing something um, kind of ignites and mm -hmm. you don't realize it becoming a business until you start having people reach out to you and asking for services and, you know, managing social media for a few friends in the golf industry. Um, I, you know, essentially started taking on clients and as I started taking on a few more, it was really cash flow positive from the beginning. Right. And social media, it got to the point where I was doing a lot of, you know, just manual work of engaging with people, you know, mm -hmm. posting general stuff. Um, I just knew I can only take on so many clients. So kind of a key, that was kind of the, a key thing oh, here is that with social media, usually they talk about, you know, a six months where your, your cash flow, you kind of started it incrementally using the power of social media. And that led, that led you to jump over that six month gap and, and keep it cash positive from the start. Totally. Yeah. So some of my first, like first clients I was working with, everything was word of mouth. They referred a few people and a lot of it was through, through social media. So, I mean, growing them through Instagram and then finding new clients through Instagram and referring people through Instagram, it really became like a nice little referral pod for myself without having to market. Um, and once I got to about 20 or 23 clients or so, um, I was pretty much tapped out. I couldn't do much, much more with my time. And, and I had, you know, a, a few good, good friends who were in the startup world in San Francisco. And that's where, I'm originally from Northern California in Monterey, so mm -hmm. just south of there a little bit. Um, they went worked at startups. They went through the the raising and and that whole acquisition process. Um, and we, I think when I when I was up there every weekend meeting with them, they were hearing about what I was charging clients, how I was scaling, and to help make my time a little easier, I built a simple um, little software solution on a Chrome extension, right, from someone on Upwork, you know, from my living room, <laughs> and you know, essentially automated a lot of the stuff I was, I was spending my time doing. And mm -hmm. I went up there one weekend after it was done, and I went from being on my phone the entire weekend with them to, you know, what are you doing? Did you stop working with people on social media? I was like, no, I just figured out how to automate a little bit of it, like the mundane tasks I knew I was doing. And that was kind of my first step to being able to scale and even think about, you know, continuing to grow this business and if we're going to raise capital or how we're going to continue to grow it. And they well, kind of all started with social media. That was the, uh, that was the thing you started leveraging that gave you the, uh, the ability and also to move quickly into um, that, that key aspect everybody's always trying to get, which is referral business. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, Colton, you know, you're growing a, a successful startup without those Silicon Valley deep pockets. You know, how, how have you made this, um, possible, I guess there's a lot of this is, is leveraging that social media. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, if, if you're starting a business, there's, there's two options. You're either 
bootstrap and grow yourself and figure out how to get cash or you raise a bunch of money and start throwing it at things and see what sticks, right? I think there's, if you have, if, if you start a business that's, that's profitable, people are paying for your stuff, figuring out how to get cash to scale it and replicate those processes is, is one of the biggest struggles I think a small business owner or like a, someone looking to scale a business is, is going through, right? Um, we figured that out by essentially looking at our customers and our happy customers and what mm-hmm. they were asking us. And, you know, most of the time it was like, Hey, we, we know we're going to be with you for, for a year or two. Can we get a discount and prepay? And we had five customers ask us that. And we were like, that's not, that's something that, you know, isn't the most common thing. Right. So if you're asking to give us money for a discount, why not? And we decided, you know, this, this worked with these guys. Let's give it a try one month and just all new customers, we require three, six or 12 month prepayments. And we figured we'd sell probably half or a third of what we were selling, right? From general leads ended up selling the same amount because we had a low price item, you know, or 150 a month, you know, so it's a total of what, $450 to get into it with it, which isn't a huge business decision for most businesses, whether it's 150 or 450 or 650 or 750, it's not like a big difference. And that's when we sold the same amount that next month and all of a sudden our cash flow tripled. So this, this so we key, from, we'll dig into this a little bit more, but you leverage it right. by building trust and then providing right. a service they wanted. And then uh, it kind of in a way, they used to call that factoring of receivables almost. You were able to pull that, that cash. That's fascinating. We got to we got to dig into this a little bit more. But before we go on to our next topic, I'd like to highlight this show sponsor, Greenwood Health Systems. Be part of the billion dollar stem cell industry. Let Greenwood Health Systems show you the way. Free to join, free website, and a great home-based biz opportunity. Download their free report today. For more info, visit nhrpc.com slash HBM or our podcast website for more information on sponsors. Customer financing is a fascinating angle. When is it a smart strategy to go to your customers first for business capital before reaching out to investors? Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's always the first, first route you should go to, right? Because giving up equity and getting in the investor, like, pot is always, I think, a little more complicated than we all think it is. And I've never went through that personally, but I know one of my co-founders has, and it's just a lot more to worry about. A lot more people with skin in the game and a lot more people relying on you for things instead of focusing on what's important to your team and what are your priorities as a business to keep remaining profitable and cash flow positive. Um, I think when you're making that decision, it's, is it possible, is your business something that is going to enable you to raise money from your from your clients, right? Is it something that people want to prepay for? Is it a service or product that you can kind of extend a discount for prepayment? Because that's really how we did it, right? It's giving them the expected discount for prepaying for services or products in the future. And not it doesn't work for every type of business, but if you can spin it in a way that it adds value to them and they're excited about it already and you're doing a great job with the product or service you're doing, that's the first and foremost thing you have to worry about. Um, it, it's definitely possible and, and it allows you to have a little more freedom and down the road, maybe taking on equity is in, in the, in the cards, right? So you, you were taking, actually able you know, to go to your existing, um, customers and get them. They didn't initially balk or like, what, what are you talking about when you're talking about six, nine right. and 12 months? It, it was, uh, you know, after you built that trust up, it was pretty, it, it was a pretty easy read to get them to come aboard with that. It, it's very much, I mean, I, I think the pricing of it is a big thing, right? If you have a, a product or service that, you know, is probably, you know, under, under two grand for 12 months of service, right? For most businesses, it's not a huge business decision, as I, as I mentioned before. So, you know, I think once you get started getting into the 5, 10, 20K contract deals where it's like, yeah, for 12 months, this is where you're going to be, it's, it's a longer lifetime to close that contract and it's just not as easy, right? I'm saying is so like pretty much anybody who's providing a service can look at this as an option. Again, get totally. building that trust. I'm just giving you some thought here. Okay, so what if you're, you're, what if you're marketing a product? It'd be a little bit, a little, the margins could be a little bit tighter on that and uh, you might not have as much leverage with a product, but I think the most home-based business owners are, and small business owners are delivering a service. So this should be a you know pretty 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 viable option for anybody. There's a ton of digital marketers out there working from home, right? Doing you know whether it's ad management, creation, design, digital work. I mean, hey, I'm a digital marketer now. <laughs> there, there you go, right? We all are, and and I think 
leveraging that type of, it's not even a contractual agreement because at the end of the day, what, what contracts are you going to really hire a lawyer to go fight and claim th- something on, right? It's Let's not talk a little bit more about that leverage you're being, so you, yeah. have, you do have a lot of accountability when you have received customer finance, in, financing. Called, you know, how do you successfully leverage this upfront capital? Um, I mean, f- for the most part, you're, that capital we're taking on has only been used to basically scale and, and grow the workforce and replicate the processes we already had in place. So I knew myself, I could reach out and generate, you know, probably 20 to 25 new sales a month for our business. And that was something I've done three, four months. You know, I could teach someone how to do that. But the problem is you hire someone, there's an upfront salary, there's things you got to worry about as a learning business. Learning curve and the whole Right, thing. learning curves, right? So we don't even, I mean, until they're two, three months in, they're not going to be closing 25 deals a month. So mm-hmm. you've got to factor that in, but that upfront capital basically, or that, that prepayment from the clients, that basically enabled me to sit back and say, look, now I have enough cash to, if someone comes in and they sell 10 three-month prepayments, mm-hmm. they're break even. Right, they don't have to sell right. 25 deals to, to get going and keep things flowing, right? And, and that can be done month month one and a half. And getting to that point now, it's like boom, we can hire another person. And and that's how we were thinking about it: is how can we scale, use these resources to keep building internally, actually grow and bring more people. And like one of the challenges right. I'm just thinking about is I'm kind of wargaming this as we're talking here is that um, you know you get the money up front. And, you know, to make sure you're budgeting and that suddenly I would think like all of a sudden, oh, the cash flow, that's the big problem. You burn through your cash flow and then, you know, there's several months left of services. And uh, so I guess you got to kind of keep an eye on that to make sure that the, uh, you know, the, you're keeping that cash flow intact. <coughs> the, I, I, that that kind of goes back to the, how you set up your billing structure in the first place. I think more and more people are getting accustomed to this whole monthly retainer or like automatic recurring billing thing, right? right. Think, think of Netflix, you know, your, your car gets charged every month. You don't even think twice about it. Mm-hmm. So at low, low ticket value items where it's a couple hundred bucks a month, it's, that's how I would set up my billing as any, any small business, like any service provider. I wouldn't even do one-time payments. I wouldn't do a three month deal and then, okay, I got to call you again after three months and get right. a check oh, or worry about collecting payment. You put them on a monthly, re- on a, on a, there's a million monthly like automated systems that we recur right. from our credit card. Mm-hmm. Super easy. We use, we started out with Moon Clerk. We still use them, right? We're doing all of our billings through Moon Clerk. It took five minutes to set up through Stripe. Yeah. And then and you're now, not dealing with that hassle of following up with that, people for their payment. You know, <laughs> right. That's, make sure you set that's, that up ahead of time. Exactly. That's the biggest bottleneck, I think, because we've, we've avoided having a, 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 a bill collecting team for three years, right? Like how much time does that take? You're on the phone trying to collect payments a lot. You don't realize it until you start doing it. Yeah. I think if you manage, uh, we talk a lot with, um, with, with business people getting in that you got to manage the expectations up front. So a lot of your clients won't, won't understand that. Oh, well, you know, I'll pay after you invoice, but if invoice me, but if you set up, if you manage that expectation up front, that if you're going to work with me and get the superior service that I provide, you know, to ease this all out and make it feasible, we have to have this recurring billing, so we're not we're not losing time and focus on that. So I think, right. I mean, if you found like man, setting that up front um, really helps to smooth it out ongoing, for sure. And it gives you an expected revenue for the next month, right? And as it, as that grows and that revenue grows, I'm not looking at cash flow this month. I'm looking at recurring revenue I've built up, right? When I get a client, I know I have a lifetime with that client, and right. you know it's it's expected to be more than three months because they're going to renew likely right? Because they had a good experience. So it's, it's one of those things where it gives you the ability to plan out your business a little bit. And when we bring on new people or you grow your team, whether it's in-house in an office or you're scaling, you know, outsourcing people and having more people, you know, joining the team that way, it it gives you some, some accountability with those customers and where they're going to, where their, their funds are going to be coming in and when. And that's, that's, that's huge for planning a business growth cycle because like when you're doing one-time sales, it's really hard to predict that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So Colton, you spoke a little bit about trust. Uh, do you have any f- further points about how savvy business owners can build trust with their customers? So that was something that I think, especially in the social media world or digital marketing world, it's it's the biggest concern with business owners is do they trust doing business with you as a person, right? Um, and as you scale your team and become a brand, I mean, then they're trusting the brand or not. And that was what we focused primarily on the first probably four months. Once I started getting customers and, you know, had them for a few months, my first priority was how do I build trust with them 
and show that and showcase that in a medium that people can see easily. And so I created testimonial videos with 12 clients as soon as I could. I went and bought two cameras, learned how to do a video interview myself, didn't look as professional as you two over here, but it did the <laughs> job, right? And I created those videos, edited them myself, got them up there, and that went out to every email that we prospected. And let me tell you something, it was night and day when you hopped on the phone with someone and they automatically had you know, some reference of, of a client or, hey, I knew this person, I've seen them at a conference or yada, yada, yada. And I was strategic with those people I reached out to initially to create those videos, right? Well, let's those, talk a little bit about this key enabler you're starting to bring up here with, you know, with social media, that social media is an, a key enabler. So, you know, talk a little more about how social media plays a part in building trust with customers and could even, you know, drive more customers uh, to you within your industry. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's combining trust with social media, I think is a great key to businesses leveraging, leveraging that trust. Cause it's so easy to get it out there now with Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I mean, LinkedIn now is becoming huge, but showcasing the pieces of content you're doing to build trust and leveraging them on those platforms is huge. That's how, you know, people discover you a lot of the time now. That's their first impression. They go to your social profiles and if they're not feeling trust or, or seeing happy experiences or, or great portfolio pieces of your company there, then, you know, they're probably going to have a bad taste in their mouth to begin with. So that's, that's something that I think social is huge for. It's, it's becoming a portfolio. It's becoming your website because people are spending their time there more often than not, right? I mean, that's just where, where it's society. Let's talk a little go. bit about the hard spots there. I mean, I understand with social media, you've got you to discipline yourself to make sure you're constantly putting up content. I mean, I know I do right. that. If I look into somebody's Facebook or LinkedIn, I see there's, there hasn't been anything there for a couple of months. It's like, uh-oh, you know, you know are, they, are they still um, viable? So you, I guess you've got to figure out ways to constantly be putting up content. It sounds like you've automated a few things um, also. Do you, you know, do you have any advice on that? To making it uh, more uh, user friendly with your time. Yeah, time time is huge for everyone these days. We're trying to do so many things and juggle so many so many different duties as a small business owner or, or doing your own grind. Yeah. Um, outsourcing is key, right? I mean, obviously we have a service and and team here that businesses outsource. Um, but you know, when I was when I was getting this thing started, I outsourced all of our content management and creation. Um, you know, through Upwork, through some of these freelancer websites. I mean, I didn't, I didn't need a creative team to help me figure out my strategy. You kind of have an idea, you know, your audience, that's the first step. And then you, I, I sat down and charted out what are their problems? What are their biggest motivators and interests? Right. And then once those all come together, it's like, okay, well, what types of content can I create or post about that are going to give them some type of value and solutions to their problems, mm -hmm. touch on those or, be, or just be things that they're interested in they can relate to because at the end of the day, they're doing business with you, right? Social is a way to attract people to you and your personality, your brand, right? And mm -hmm. it's, that's, it's a unique medium to be able to do that. Well, I want to so, bring out um, really one key point that you mentioned there, an audience might have missed it, particularly for like a small business, home business owner who's like wearing all the hats in their business is to really seek out those, um, that outsource support and look through like some of the websites that are out there where you can get that support or maybe use the referrals of somebody, but you know, finding that kind of support to, to you know, get some of these automated things off of your back um, could be a, you know, could be a, a, a good strategy to go in. For sure. And, and you can't really scale yourself, right? So that's only one. I mean, you. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy, but I, I mean, we work with a lot of freelancers and a lot of people that, you know, either they run other agencies and, and they utilize us for social, for their aspects of social, right? And I talk to them and a lot of them are, are one-man shows, one-woman shows, mm -hmm. right? They're running 10, 20 accounts or, or brands, social media profiles, and, and they learn a lot. But the biggest thing is like, you know, I can't, they say I can't take on any more clients or I can't do any more, right? I can't, I can't find another me. Can't scale but yourself. <laughs> you can't scale yourself. And it, it's just funny because I guess... Like when I was first thinking that you get upset because people don't do the same level of work you do, right? You have to right. check everything, redo stuff. And as if you have a high level of expectations for yourself and your work you provide for clients or whatever you're doing, I think it's, that's a really t tough step to get over because you have to be okay with someone doing 85% of the stuff. Okay. Right. And like you're, you, the only way to scale is to accept that, that no one's going to be quite as good as you are. In, in some cases, but some people will be a lot better than you are in a lot of other cases. And that's the thing I've come to realize is as I've scaled and brought people onto the team in different dynamics, 
we've created new services, things I never thought I would ever be able to do myself or with people around me on my team. And that's because like I took a step back and I was like, look, I can't do more of this. I need to outsource it to some people who can get it done. Maybe not as good as I can, but it opened up so many more doors for my business to grow and add revenue in other ways that never would have been possible. Without yeah, you that. brought out such a key, you brought out such a key important point that you're never going to get the level of whatever that you're going to put into it. So you got to accept that it's not going to be quite as good and be careful of not cycling back in and, you know, fixing things to the point that by the time you total it all up, you're spending more time than with the outsource work. Cause I've seen that, you know, I've seen that happen before. And that's a really good point that you brought up. But one question I have, is there any particular type of social media that you like best? Like I know in the, you know, professional type of linking LinkedIn is, is good, but have you had any good like experience with Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest or anything else stands out? Yeah, most of what we do is on Instagram for businesses now. Two years ago, it was kind of Facebook first when I first started this thing and we first started getting going. Client, like Businesses were still creating content for Facebook. Now, and then they would share it to Instagram from there. Mm -hmm. So now it's reversed over the last year. People are creating content for Instagram first and now Facebook is that secondhand thought where they'll just share the same content to Facebook, right? Did you say Instagram um, for business? Okay. So it, it, it depends on, on, the, on the business. Um, B2B, I recommend LinkedIn, spending your time on LinkedIn. If, okay. if, if it's a B2B service or business, you're going to get a lot of value out of connecting with people there because you can look at their, their job role or their, their careers, their positions, who's a decision maker, who do you need to spend time with um, nurturing right, and building a relationship with versus Instagram, it's a very consumer-driven market. right? Mm -hmm. People are looking and discovering new services, products, but mostly for consuming. So it's not so much, I, I can't tell who owns a business who doesn't. And as a brand, if I have a consumer-based product or service, great. Spend time on Instagram. That's where everybody's at. Like a reality TV show. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, and, and I mean, if, if you're, some B2B businesses still do great on Instagram and, and we work with some of them as from content creation standpoint to management to growth. Um, but usually there's a different um, end goal with those. And, you know, while this whole thing's about scaling, I think this kind of goes back to another way how you can utilize social media to help scale your business is adding trust to, to potential hires and prospects who are evaluating your team and business if they want to join it, if they want to work with you, whether you're, you know, working at home or not. That was a struggle for us. It's like you don't have an office. It's hard to get people motivated to want to join your team, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a great starting point for us. Is, is like showing them an inside look is into what you're doing every day and, and how your team's effectively helping people and that morale and culture that you're building, you know, whether it's a remote business or not. I mean, we work, worked remote for up to like 10 people when we started going and it, that was a great stand, starting point to attract people. You're showing that the oh, team. Yeah, it's, a flexible work book. it's flexible work, but if totally. you play that right, you're feeding an image to your to your clients that uh, being home-based or whatever doesn't even matter anymore. They're, you know, they're, they're totally. seeing the image that you, that you shape through social media. Right, right. And you can craft that, right? You can portray that opportunity. And, and even for your for both your prospective, um, you know, hires and team members down the road and your clients who are getting a, a, a basis of if you're someone they want to work with, they get to see into, you know, kind of how you want to uh, portray yourself and your character, right? And so that's, I mean, my, my Instagram personally, that's pretty much all I do. I'm just posting things that, that if, if I were going to hire my team and I'm going to look at someone on that team, what am I going to think about that person? And if I'm, is it going to positively affect me to want to work with them more? I always look at things from your customer's right? perspective. <laughs> That's huge. That's the biggest thing that I tell everybody that we work with. It's, they kind of, they kind of get in this like me, 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 mm -hmm. me point, right? Where everything they post on social media is very self-centered towards the business and what they're doing so great versus adding value to their clients and target audience, right? Going back to that whiteboard where you put up all their problems and all, all their interests, right? And every post thinking about how does that fit into something up on that board? How does that add value to something for that audience you're trying to interact with and build relationships with? Because they don't care about you, right? They care about what you can do for them and why are they going to follow you and continue to engage? That, that's really the biggest thing to be successful on social. Client so focus, mm -hmm. client focus, client focus. <laughs> yeah. Colton, this has been a great discussion on leveraging your customers for financing. Do you have any final points you would like to share? Um, I think, you know, we talked a lot about social media um, and, you know, kind of the, the whole spectrum there, but going back to really like 
growing your business and raising capital through your customers, which I think is, is a really interesting point. And a lot of businesses are doing it. I think it just may be in combination of also raising funds and other things, right? But we did it. That's the only thing that we got our capital from was our clients. And it just goes back to providing a solid service and seeing if there's that fit with your clients and what, what the service you're providing is doing for them, right? That's a good point uh, to end on. You, you know, you, you, yeah. you brought up an innovative point, but keep in mind that it's part of, uh, you know, a diversified fi financing strategy. It's just one part of the uh, piece to the and, puzzle. And, and even though most of us aren't, you know, software as service solutions, right? We're not SaaS software companies, right? We're providing services a lot from, from our homes and doing digital marketing and stuff. It doesn't mean you can't think of yourself as one. Right. It doesn't mean you can't bill like one. And that was the biggest thing that, that I think I came into that. I mean, I, I worked in some, some software startups in my, in my past and starting some and trying to think about how they're billing. And I came into the agency world thinking, Jesus Christ, I don't want to have to worry about billing and collecting and worrying about all stuff. I did that for my dad growing up. It's the one I wanted to avoid. That's why I got into software. So I kind of took that software methodology of how they bill and brought it to the agency world. And not only did it save us a lot of time in hiring and like collecting you know, payments, but it, it really made it very easy to ask our customers with all of that in place, the automated billing, the monthly recurring payments, right? To, to basically change that number from month recurring one month to three, six, 12 months and collect that front. Oh, yeah, it became a, you know, a key enabler for your business. Well, oh, Colin Bollinger, thank you for being such a great guest on the Home Business Podcast. To learn more about Colton Bollinger, visit jumpermedia.co or our podcast website for more information on guests. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Home Business Podcast. Share your feedback with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or at our website, homebusinessmag.com. Visit the website for information on advertising. Subscribe to our newsletter. Please visit our sponsors. For more info, visit homebusinessmag.com or the expo at homebusinessexpo.com. I'm Richard Captain Henderson saying anchors away. We'll talk with you soon. Until then. Make it a great home-based biz day.